Mechamocha, here we go. Mechamocha Be'elam Hashem, Mechamocha Nether Kodesh. Who is like you among the Elam, O Lord? Try to figure out who's like you among the supernal creatures, beings, etc. God created the world on his own. There is no one else but God, and there's nothing else but God. What do we mean that there's nothing else? Didn't God create a world? Which is actually where we're going to get back to. The general idea that what was created during creation if there's nothing. And what does it mean to be a created being? We focus on a bunch of different things, what we call shittuk versus idolatry. That's one thing that we focus on. And according to Torah, neither of them are okay, especially not for a Jewish person. For not Jewish people, it's kind of a little bit back and forth about it. So there's only God in the world and God created everything. And how did he create everything? Something from nothing. But then with that question is something from nothing, how does the whole idea of creation work? And that's when we went through all the different examples of what we call the mazal, like the flow of things, that it starts off in the higher world. So it looks like one thing. And then it goes through a progression and there's all these gradations, etc. that occur. And then there's got to be a leap of something that occurs from nothing, as in a physical come from spiritual material coming from spiritual give an example foliage and grass and leaves and trees start up up there as angels and down here they manifest as the trees and the leaves etc and the reason for that and then obviously the whole thing with the rooster coming from the idea of the ruhr and it's angels etc and then all of a sudden the leap occurs and down here it's the rooster and then the whole thing with the snow and it's talking about the 10th thing of the divine light really looking at highlights here now tim tim okay we went to the lion what did the lion look like on the higher realms lion is like wisdom which is like sight Basically how all these things, there's certain attributes that unite them all the way up there. And then as they come down here, they start taking on their form, start differentiating more. Till that actually becomes a physical creation, and that's a totally differentiated form. These three heads of strength, etc. Last time we did day and night, for whatever reason, day is the written law and night is the oral law. And we just see the parallel for that, even though it seems weird to make this connection from. We get the connection just because that's how Moshe Rabbein knew the difference. Moses up on the mountain, he knew on his daytime and nighttime according to which chart he was learning and also according to the songs of the angels, like the praise of the angels to God. We don't really see what the connection is, but there is one because that's how Moshe knew the difference. There's something there that we can't necessarily understand or see, but it's there. And we got to the idea that Torah is considered the primordial metaphor because the same way a metaphor obscures something, it also explains something. So Torah is what allows us to understand the divine. And somehow this all comes back to day and night that manifests down here in the physical world. The whole question of how can Moshe tell day and night is because there's no night up there. There's no darkness. And night is defined by the fact that it's dark. If there's no darkness up there, how does Moshe know when it's nighttime? So how does Moshe know? So he knew according to the Torah, etc. Okay, now we get on to the next section. It's a general idea of what it means for something to be created either through a chain light, cause and effect, which we've kind of seen some of these before, but we'll see it all again. So what does it mean for something to be created through a chain like cause and effect versus a something from a nothing? How did that manifest? It's going to go back now to the general idea of creation, of what was created... The whole idea of, of that fact that God created worlds, etc. if there's only God. One thing that we have to look at is that there's different forms about how something could come into being. There's different ways that things are created. We have this general thing which we call a shtalshul, such a chain. We've seen this before, where the links in a chain, the bottom of one is the top of the other. Something that's related to the chain, it's called ila and Allah, which is cause and effect. You can see, you can actually trace how one action kind of feeds into the other. It's almost like a chain reaction. That means that even when you get to the end of something, as in if you get all the way to the fact, however many steps it took, to get to that effect, there's something in that effect that speaks to the original cause. Because it's one thing that just keeps evolving. So you have a tree, and you cut it down, and you gotta shade down the wood, and build a table out of it. So even if you end up painting over the table and staining it, it's a totally different color, but I can see the wood in there, or like the horals or whatever, and I'll know, okay, this, this is from a tree. So here, the general idea of, of the chain and the cause and effect is that whatever evolves from it recognizes its source. It sees, it can, it can kind of see where it came from. Right, or think about like if you have like a spring that feeds into a river, that springs into a waterfall, that feeds into a lake, that feeds into another river, and eventually it feeds into the ocean. I can map that. I could trace all of it, even if it's all of a sudden it became salt water and there was fresh water, but it's got the water source is still all part of it. So the evolved, whatever comes out of it recognizes its source. Like in a chain, there's connecting rings. So each stage is attached to the stage that comes next, and it's aware of the stage before it. So it's part of also recognizing the source. Like I can see how it came to be. I can see what came before me. So an example that they give for this is intellect and emotions. Why intellect and emotions? Because emotions are fed by intellect. That's where emotions come from, the intellect. According to Tanya, if you do everything correctly, chapter three. Thinking on an object, the more you think about something, you're gonna cause yourself to desire it. So even before you actually feel love manifest in your heart for this object, you have the initial phase that's going on in the intellect. So that's how intellect creates, feeds into emotions. But even after the emotion emerges, so even once I feel this love in my heart for it, I want this thing, it's still nourished by the intellect. 
because through thought, I've concluded that the object is good and thereby desired. Meaning, we know that the mind could create emotion. If I decide something is good for me, I'm gonna want it. And even I could decide it up here and eventually I could start feeling it in my heart, that I'm gonna want this. But even once I start feeling it in my heart, there's not a disconnect that occurs between the intellect and the emotion because the mind is still gonna feed it. As long as the mind sees it as being desired, then I'm gonna feel a love toward it. If you've ever gone through phases, fads are actually a very good example of it. You get surrounded by something that everybody's into it and then all of a sudden it gets around to the next thing. What happened? Put the mind somewhere else so it created an emotion somewhere else. Obsessiveness is good examples, but we can do these on simpler levels even. We don't have to get obsessed with everything for this whole system to work. It also depends on where you are in life. Sometimes when you're uh, 18, you think something's good for you. By the time you're 26, you're like, that was dumb. How the intellect matures, better emotions come out of it. The general idea is that when the intellect, the mind decides this is good for me, it will lead to an emotion and the emotion is going to be present and fed as long as my mind is still going to be fixed on it. Even if there's varying degrees of focus, it's still feeding it. Because once the mind's going to decide, no, I'm over this, the feeling's going to dissipate. This is considered cause and effect because one has led to the other. And I could kind of trace it back. The second thing here is what we call yeshmi ayin. Yeshmi ayin means a something from nothing. All the descriptions that we gave about the spiritual realms, malchus is coming down, it's giving the light to the world. So then you have to have these five gurus of bina, which are the five parts of speech. Wake it up as they go back up again. And what that looks like is the angel Gabriel waking up the souls. All those, the one that feeds into the other, that whole progression in the spiritual realms, that's cause and effect. Yeshmi ayin, something from nothing, comes when the spiritual realms, they finish evolving or devolving, depending which direction you're going in. And all of a sudden, how do you get to a physical? world. You can't. You can't make physical matter out of spiritual matter. So the only way you can get from one to the other is God factor. That's called something from nothing. In that regard, the creative force hides from the created being or it can't exist. If we actually could see the godness that's creating us, we wouldn't be able to exist as independent entities the way we exist. It's the idea of the sun ray going back into the sun. There's no sun ray anymore. Particularly because sun rays exist where there's not a bright sunshine. When you usually see a sun ray, like, oh, the sun rays are peeking through the clouds. So that's when you don't have just blanket sunshine. When you're in the middle of the desert, you're not like, where are the sun rays? There's no sun rays in the middle of the desert in the clear blue sky. There's only sun rays when you start having clouds and things are walking in and stuff like that. The light gets narrowed in certain ways. Now we have sun rays. Otherwise, it's just sun. So if we would see the full creative force, we wouldn't be able to exist as independent entities. From the creative's perspective, the source is nothing. Using like a double meaning here that we say yesh mein, something from nothing, where like you have physical from spiritual. So physical matter from spiritual matter, spiritual matter is considered nothing. It's because it has no substance to it. Not a thing that we can measure. But the other way of saying something from nothing is that we have been created and we look at our source and we're like, what's your source? Our source is nothing. Because <laughs> we can't see, we can't identify it. Some people can walk around and just think that we're just here without recognizing the fact that no, we're not just here. So what happens with creation? There's myriad stages of involvement, a perception that's similar to Ila and Alu. Ila and Alu is cause and effect. We have all the stages as we just explained. Then what happens, the source conceals itself from the evolved entity until it becomes a created being. All the higher realms, they recognize their source. Remember, it's like the marine life versus terrestrial life. So the higher realms, they recognize their source. Even as they're moving farther away from it, they recognize that they're part of a chain and that there's a higher attachment. Eventually though, when you're at the bottom, all the way to the bottom of that spiritual chain, the source is gonna hide itself. And now we could eventually make the jump to physical matter. And then we're like, where's your source? Well, the source is nothing. Like we're just here because we can't see the source. So that all leads us to ask the very good question. Does that mean that the entire world is just an illusion? And if it is an illusion, what happened during creation? The Torah very clearly tells us that there's creation. And even if someone wants to say, oh no, it's metaphorical, we can't discount the literal interpretation of the text. The Rebbe has a letter where someone says, because there's a lot of people who say when it says the six days of creation, maybe it's eons it's talking about. Day one is a thousand years, day two is a thousand years, etc. And the Rebbe says, we can't disclude the literal interpretation of the text because that means there's no basis for Shabbos anymore. The whole point of Shabbos is that six days he worked and the seventh day he rested. So if we're working on a thousand years, then where does Shabbos come from anymore? What's Shabbos at that point? Why do we celebrate Shabbos if we haven't gone through 6,000 years yet? That means that when there was creation, God actually created something. But according to everything that we're talking about, everything that we've seen so far, like, oh, everything's cause and effect, and all go back to the source of God, etc. Are we here? We're we just being tricked into thinking that we're here. <laughs> are we just mirages? We're given this like conscious state, tricking ourselves into reality. Are we in the matrix or not? And then with all these questions, are Torah mitzvahs real? Is reward and punishment real? If the world is just an illusion, everything else becomes irrelevant. What does it matter to do Torah mitzvahs? Um, how can you talk about reward and punishment if there's not a real world? Which brings us all the way back. This is basically like the fundamental question of the mimer is that, is there actually a real world if nothing in the world exists except for God? there's nobody like you God among all among everything and then the commentary say this means that there is no one and nothing but God so do we exist or don't we exist yes anyway so Lisa see this question they bring this example this is from the Mishnah Sanhedrin okay so it's not from the Gemara it's from the Mishnah so it talks out of Machashev they have this question there's two people in a field gathering cucumbers one gathers cucumbers with sorcery and the other gathers cucumbers with an illusion of sorcery 
are they liable? Because we know the Torah tells us that you're not allowed to do magic. There's actually a commandment that you're not allowed to allow a witch to live. There's a whole story actually in the Gemara about it. Yeah, Shem ben Shatach and there are 80 witches of Ashkelon. Ashkelon is a beautiful city on the coast. They basically discovered there were 80 witches living there. Great sage of Shem ben Shatach, whatever leader he was, so it felt to him that he had to take care of him because the Torah very clearly says witches are not allowed to live. There's a lot of prohibitions against different kind of magical things. Magic that we know of today is really just illusions. So he had to go, he devised this whole thing. It was raining and they had to put on the raincoats and they bring the raincoats they put in the jar and they have to pretend like they flew there with these 80 strong men kind of thing and the witch can only do magic if she's attached to the ground so some of them had to go and figure out how to lift them up from the ground they went they, they killed the witches they took care of the witches but then like the extended family the witches wanted to have revenge for what he did and there's this whole story about how they made up this whole thing where they falsified witnesses and convicted his son and his son was killed because of these false witnesses so like in Perkei a saying from him that has something to do with law and justice so if you understand the whole story behind it Basically, by the time they figured out that the witnesses were lying, it was too late. Because usually it's very rigorous. The testing for witnesses, especially when it comes to something that could lead to capital punishment, is very, very rigorous. So obviously they, they were very well prepared. And by the time they figured out it was too late and his son was, it was capital punishment. Usually when they tell kids the story, they stop it at the end of him getting rid of the witches. They don't usually tell the second part of the story. They go, there's everything in the world. Anyways, back to this. So the Torah is very clear against no magic. So we have this question. If there's no world, then who cares what people do? But if there is a world, then we do care what people do. One who performs a real act of sorcery is liable, but not one who deceives the eyes, making it appear as though he is performing sorcery, as that is not considered sorcery. A trick to look like sorcery is not the same as actually performing sorcery. Rabbi Kiva says in the name of Rabbi Yeshua, for example, two people gather cucumbers by sorcery. One gathers cucumbers and is exempt, and one gathers cucumbers and is liable. How so? The one who performs a real act of sorcery is liable, the one who deceives the eyes is exempt. Meaning, if there's no world and everything's just an illusion, then if a person does sorcery, who cares? We're not even here anyways. Is the magic even here anyways? Nothing's really here anyways, so who cares? But here, the mission is giving a ruling if a person performs real magic, then they're actually liable for it, which means to say that if there's real Torah mitzvahs and real reward and punishment, then we must really be here. As in, we are not an illusion. Versus someone who only makes it look like it's magic is not actually liable because he didn't actually do magic. The point they're making is that they're bringing down this thing where two people do what looks like magic, two people do what looks like sorcery, one actually did the sorcery and one only made it look like he did sorcery. They're casting rulings. This one is liable and this one's exempt. So what are you casting rulings for if, if the whole world is just an illusion? How can you blame a person who performs magic if the entire world is just magics? Why are you punishing him? The Rabbi Maharaj is bringing this example to say no. The reason why you have this ruling is because the whole world is not just magics. The world has to be here for there to be a liability. Side note, which is basically the premise that we're working off of. What is the proof that we have of the world being a true entity? How do we know the world really exists? This comes from Torah Mitzvahs. You just saw an example here. Torah Mitzvahs is what tells us that the world's a true identity. How can we rely on Torah Mitzvahs? Because Torah Mitzvahs are real. Torah's truth, it's eternal, it's God's wisdom. It's a real thing, Torah. The fact that the world is real, how do we know this? Because Torah Mitzvahs. Torah Mitzvahs is something real. So we're going to rely on something real to tell us that we're real. Indicating that man's divine service causes the world to exist and become a true entity. Okay. If you're going to try to figure something out, you have to go to something that you can rely upon. So what can we rely upon to tell us truth? The ultimate truth. Torah Mitzvahs. Torah's truth, it's eternal, it's applicable for all times, all places, it's unchanging. God's word. So we know, okay, Torah's something that's real. God's real, his Torah is real. Torah tells us that we're real. Why does Torah make this indication? Because through our divine service, as in when we do Torah mitzvahs, this is what causes the world to exist and become a real entity. Because God created the world for Torah mitzvahs. So when we do what we're supposed to do for Torah mitzvahs, this is what perpetuates the world. This is what keeps the world going as a real entity. Because if man would just ditch it all, God forbid, then what does God need the world for? This is what we came to. We're asking the question, does the world really exist? And we have this proof about magic. The fact that you could punish somebody for doing something like this in the world means that we're not just an illusion. Versus angels, all these beings in the spiritual realms, do they really exist? They don't have magical cucumber fields. It draws a contrast between man and angels. There is a difference between our existences. So angels are what's referred to as sechlem nivdalim. Sechlem comes with the word seichel. If you've heard the word seichel, it's logic, the mind. They're called separate and abstract intelligences. Why? They're supernal creatures devoid of material content, pure spirit and only distinguishable by differing degrees of intellect. We could tell the difference between people because we look different. Our physical matters what makes us look different. Our faces, our characteristics, our heights, etc. What's the same in all of us is our spiritual entities. The fact that we all have a piece of God in us. But that's not what we see. That's not how we distinguish between each other. We distinguish according to physical characteristics. So an angel has no physical matter. So how do you tell the difference between one angel and the next? How do angels live exist? How do, who says they're here? The only way you can tell the difference between these spiritual entities is through their level of intelligence. What's their level of understanding? Remember, we have the angels that are in the level of emotion versus angels that are more in the level of intellect. Remember, the different worlds have different entities, etc. So that's how you can tell the difference between angels, like the spiritual entities. 
Okay, now we actually have, this is from Rambam and it's called Sefer Karm. This is the philosophers, Jewish philosophers, they deal with this. What are angels? What do they look like? They're gonna basically support this. Yes, this is what angels are like. The angels are likewise incorporeal intelligences without matter. There's no physical matter to an angel. But they're nevertheless created beings and Hashem created them as will be explained below. Okay, we're not gonna get to that part. In Bereshus Rambam, Bereshus, so that's, it explains, it's part of the oral law that's on the part of Bereshus. It's the following remark of our sages. The angel is called the flame of the sword, which is turned every way. It's probably talking about the angel that's in front of the Garden of Eden. That once Adam was, there was an angel that stood with flamey, fiery sword. In accordance with the words, his minister is a flaming fire. The attribute which turned every way is added because angels are changeable in form. They appear at one time as males, at another as females, now as spirits, now as angels. If there's no physical matter to an angel, then whatever entity they have can morph, is basically what it's saying. Now this remark that clearly stated that angels are incorporeal and have no permanent bodily form independent of the mind of him who perceives them. They exist entirely in prophetic vision and depend on the action of the imaginative power. Basically, angels can manifest in many different ways. They're not limited to any physical form. In general, angels are spirits of air and fire and we're beings of earth and water. So we know we have physical beings, entities, bodies that distinguish us. Angels have no specific form to them so they can form however they, they need to or want to. Also, more philosophy on all this stuff. There's a dispute concerning the existence of angels between the philosophers and the sages of the Torah. All agree that angels exist, but they differ about their substance. The Torah tells us that there's angels. So what do they look like? What do they do? Who's seen them? The philosophers say that as their essence is simple intellect, we cannot conceive that there should be plurality among them. As I saw again, how you can tell the difference between them if they're just beings of intellect. So plurality in things is in saying that there's gonna be a lot of different types of things. Agreeing in form can only be due to the matter. We have physical matter. Saying that plurality everywhere is due to matter and unity to form. Unity being superior to duality. Now since angels as being separate intellects are not material, it is inconceivable how they can differ from each other except by one being the cause and the other the effect. For this reason, they say that the number of the separate intellects is 10. The same as the number of the spheres, which is nine or 10, if we include the matter which is beneath the lunar sphere. The 10 spheres, the 10 attributes. Here, again, it's, it's the general idea of what do angels look like? What are they made out of? And it's kind of agreeing that they, because they have no material form to them, how are you supposed to tell the difference between them? The only way you tell the difference between them is what kind of intellect they have. What is their level of understanding of godliness? And so this conclusion is that there's nine slash 10 different intellects among the angels. Nine slash 10 different types within the angels. Now we have this from the Gemara. So we went through this whole thing, what do angels, as in distinguished from man. We have a physical form. We know that people, if someone does magic, so look at that, we believe in real magic. They say actually that in Egypt, they had black magic. Remember how we spoke about how things change at different times? During the first temple, the pull for idolatry is very strong. And then that was gotten rid of because we couldn't handle it anymore. Egypt was actually steeped in black magic. They abused it. And so that was one of the things also that was blessed and taken away. It says clearly that he went to his sorcerers to do stuff. The snake, the blood, and the frogs were all imitated by Egyptian sorcerers. Lice is the one that they had them at because it's too small. They couldn't do it. But the snake, the blood, and the frogs, they were able to imitate it, which is also part of why Pharaoh's not impressed. We could do that too. You make frogs, we make frogs, Mazel tov. Now it's not the same kind of access that it was back in Egypt, but it's still, it's considered something that's totally, it's forbidden. Anyways, so this whole discussion. So do the angels actually do, exist? Do these supernal entities exist? This is a fun story. This is in the Gemara that talks about when Hashem wanted to create people, he went to the angels and said, should we create people? And they're like, I don't know, should we? Why would you create people? They're very anti-human. These guys, what for? What do you need them for? Remember, Moshe went up to get the Torah and they're like, no, you can't have it. Rav Yehuda says, the Rav says, at the time that the Holy One blessed be, he sought to create a person, he created one group of ministering angels. Remember, we actually have this all the way in the beginning. The sages differ was at the second day of the fifth day of creation, but angels are created before man. So he said to them, if you agree, let us fashion a person in our image. As in, we're gonna have these attributes. So if they have attributes, God has attributes, we mirror God in the attributes. God shows us what kindness looks like. We imitate God's kindness. God shows us what strength discipline looks like. We imitate that. The fact that anything that we can do is an imitation of God is basically what this all means. So the angel said before, master of the universe, what are the actions of this person you suggest to create? God said to them, his actions are such and such. As in according to human nature, they're gonna be both good and evil. So the angels are like, wait a second. Let's think this through. You wanna create a man that looks in our image? What are these people? What is this man going to be? God said they're gonna be good and they're gonna be not good. They're gonna be humans. So the angel said before, master of the universe, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you think of him? From Tehillim. Manosh kisis kerenu. Veradam kisis kedenu. So the angels are like, eh, don't make this person. As in, such a creature is not worth creating. He's good and he's bad. He's yes, he's no, he's odd, he's cold. How are you supposed to deal with something like that? So the angels said, don't create something like that. Well, how does Hashem respond to that? Hashem outstretched his small finger among them and burned them with fire. What is going on with this story? Obviously, we have questions. And, and actually, the story continues. So God created a second group and a third group, whatever it is. But the general idea that we're looking at here is actually the second part where it says, the angels are like, eh, don't create me and God outstretched his small fingers and he burned them. So what's going on here? What's the little finger? 10 fingers. And the little finger is the lowest level of the fingers. If we look at our chart of the attributes, what's the 10th level? What's the lowest level? Is what we call 
Machos. That's the aspect, remember, that gives the light over to creation. That's the bottom of the chain, that's the top of the next chain. When it talks about how God fresh out his little finger, which whatever that all supposed to mean, it's saying here that he showed them a higher level of the creative power. Gave them, he showed them more than the allotment of divine light needed to create them was revealed. The creator has to hide from its source for physical entities to come, for us to come into being. Up there, God showed them there's a certain amount of light that brings the angels into being. And God showed them an extra measure. What happened? They got nullified. They went out of existence. They couldn't handle it. Therefore, the Bible concludes that angels are not considered true existence. Because look at how easily they were just like, okay, gone. Well, also then when they, uh, are they there? They're not there. They were gone so easily. The angels are not considered true existence. Man, on the other hand, through fulfilling Hashem's will in the physical world, we transcend the limitations that are inherent in creation. Thereby, we're able to receive a revelation without losing our existence. When we do Torah mitzvot, we receive a higher level of, of revelation, as in like higher than what was needed to bring us into existence, and we can handle it. Which goes to show that we actually, because we can maintain our existence this way, it goes to show that we are real entities. That we all real existence. Think of like a like a bubble. You can't move the bubble around or it's gonna pop. The bubble only stays as long as you could hold it in your soapy hand. Maybe sometimes you could kind of transfer, but that bubble has a very short lifespan. So you're not gonna rely upon a bubble. It's not considered substantive enough. And we're actually gonna get into this idea of like a river. If something's called living waters and the river dries up after seven years, it's not considered living waters. These are the rules of things, etc. That it's just gonna further substantiate this general idea that angels are not like a true entity. They're not true existence because they're so easily, quote unquote, easily dispatched of. They're a little bit more like bubbles. So now we have two proofs, the magic gathering the cucumbers, and we have this fact that our divine service allows us this great level of revelation and we're still here. This is further proof that we are actually here. We do have real existence as far as we're concerned. That's basically what it is.